My name is Yaron, and uh, in South Africa, often my name is pronounced Yarona, which means from the community. And um, I see myself as a bit of a child of the universe. Um, I spent a lot of time in India, and a lot of the insights that I got from traveling in India have had a huge impact on how I approach Africa. And uh, actually got a Hindi name as well called Premanand. And uh, at the end of the day, you can call me anything you like, just call me. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I arrived in Africa, and I want to share with you a little bit about my African romance uh, as a teenager at 15. And I was born in, in Watford, and I lived in Israel for many, many years. And uh, it was quite a culture shock. It was exciting, like every romance at the beginning. Uh, new uh, place. I absolutely loved Africa, but at the time I felt it was very restricted and very backwards because of the time that we, we lived in. Uh, the part up was still very much uh, um, a matter of the day. And Zim actually was actually a very, very beautiful country those days. I don't know if you remember, in 95 I went for a beautiful uh, journey in, in Zimbabwe. And I was quite disillusioned and quite confused. I didn't know what to do. And uh, I, when I went to Wurzen in, in 1998, it was a real right, uh, in every sense of the word right. Uh, you know, we, we ended up getting arrested quite a few times. And it was a, a very, very tough time to be in South Africa. So I decided to leave, and I didn't feel that I was totally congruent with the African continent. And I went to live in, in the US, and I went to live in the UK. And uh, it was very interesting for me. Obviously, I had a lot of choice, uh, because I had a British passport. Uh, I could get a job anywhere that I wanted to. Um, but when I came back to seeing where I belong. I always felt that I have an African heart, and I felt that this is the place where I want to be. I missed Africa, I missed being here, I missed uh, the, the beautiful country and continent, uh, specifically uh, South Africa. So um, when I came back in 1992 uh, for a short visit, I decided to stay. And it was uh, one of the best decisions I've made. I've now spent most of my life here in Africa. and. Uh, it's just had omnipotent potential. The country was, South Africa was very, very exciting. The African continent was very encouraged by the way South Africa has actually evolved. And um, I, I really decided that I want to be part of this change. And I love this quote from Gandhi that says, you should be the change that you want to see in the world. So I decided to come up with a few solutions. And I started a company in 1998. It was called at the time digitalmall.com. And really what we did is, is we did designed a company based on the low internet penetration in Africa at the time and in South Africa to be able to service multiple retailers that wanted to set up e-commerce stores. Amazon was huge and uh, a lot of people were buying online, but in South Africa there was very little activity in e-commerce. So we decided to set up what's called today a cloud provider or then was called an application service provider or commerce service provider. And uh, we had to provide a turnkey solution for the retail partners because delivery to the home has just not been something that really happened. I think there was Mr. Delivery and you could order pizza and that was it. Um, so we set a 4PL business, which stands for IT people, IT use a lot of TLAs, three letter acronyms. So 4PL stands for uh, fourth party logistics. And we had to look at how we can deliver goods into people's homes and we set up a contact center because believe it or not, a lot of you probably buy online all the time today and you use your credit card on the internet. But those days, there was a perception that it was unsafe to use your credit card on the internet. So people would browse online and then phone the contact center and place the order. And the contact center would also play a very important role in making sure that there's quality assurance and that the orders actually get delivered. So if there's an issue, the customer could phone and we could do all the deliveries. And it was really, really exciting. It was really the start of e-business uh, in South Africa. And to make it easy for people, we thought we'll create this virtual assistant. You can see her up there, Hannah, we're very proud of her. And she used to change, by the way, the reason we use the, the name Hannah is because it's spelled the same both ways, if you notice. So when you display it on mobile, on web, it's very, very easy to display it from both sides and it's very easy to read. Um, and when you bought sushi, we actually sold sushi online as well, Hannah would turn into a Japanese look and say, Domo, you know, and thank you in Japanese, or if you bought from Toys R Us, or Reggie's with our clients at the time, she would get a, a very funky kind of teenager look uh, and say thank you to you. So it was a way of actually encouraging people to, to shop online. And our first advert, which I absolutely loved, was if you can't bring Mohammed to the mountain, give him a modem. And our, our first online store, because we had this really sensible approach to where we were at the time and a very realistic kind of measure, was Virtual Florist. And we partnered with a real physical retailer, 
uh, called Flower Out, and we were profitable within nine months, which was absolutely amazing considering that there were about 50,000 people on the internet at the time, um, and it was uh, really the beginning. Um, another thing that I learned through my journey and the experience is that through the internet, the world has become a lot more interconnected, and it's a global village, and that's why it's called the World Wide Web. We're all part of this amazing web, and on the 5th of September 1999, I decided to get married, and I, got married, I wanted to get married in Amanos because my wife and I, uh, at the time she wasn't my wife, but uh, uh, my wife and I now, spent quite a romantic weekend there when the whales were there, so I wanted the whales in my wedding, because I think it's quite a wonderful, beautiful, natural uh, phenomena that we have here in, Af in South Africa. We have really the best of all worlds. And unfortunately, my grandmother was, uh, was, was not able to come at the time. So I thought of which way could I use my understanding of technology to get her to come over to, uh, to South Africa. And she couldn't, so I decided to broadcast my wedding on the internet. And we set up a site called Digi Wedding, and it was a really great idea. And I told a few people, and the next thing our PR company got a lot of press. And it was all over the newspapers, and I was on John Robbie's show, and he asked me uh, if I'd get divorced, would I do it online as well? Um, and if I have a baby, will I also broadcast that? So it was quite a joke, but because it got so much media hub, and we called it the Wedcast, um, <clears throat> we had 47,000 people attend my wedding virtually. And remember that those days, we're talking ISDN lines, right? So we put the first ISDN line in Hermanus, and we had a truck outside that broadcasted it live and it was absolutely amazing. The only thing is that because the internet capacity in South Africa was not that uh, wide, uh, 47,000 people watching video at the same time, we crashed the whole view units infrastructure. And for about 35 minutes I became infamous for, for crashing the whole of, of units infrastructure at the time, which was, which was uh, just uh, something that was nice to be infamous by. Okay. <laughs> crash the internet. Okay, so um, one of the things that we also looked at is how do we take some, some amazing things that are about Africa and export them. So one of the most beautiful things in Africa, and we're going to hear a lot of it uh, this afternoon, is amazing talent in African music. And I am absolutely passionate about African music. I think we've got really, really awesome. And the internet is a wonderful way of actually broadcasting uh, talent directly to the world. And we had Spanish radio stations and German radio stations and French radio stations playing African music because it was up on the internet on radio stations without to ever meeting the artists, which was just unbelievable. And those days there was no digital rights management solutions, which means that you can't control who's downloading what. So all the music was available for free, which is really where the open source movement later on came up with, make things available, uh, make it easily accessible. And I soon realized that if we're going to monetize this, because I'm at the end of the day an entrepreneur and I wanted to commercialize it, we're going to need to find different ways of actually uh, monetizing music. And uh, one of the ways was to get our artists that were playing online to actually get booked to go for a tour in Turkey or in Europe. Uh, another one was uh, to actually partner with some record labels and eventually uh, we decided to become a record label. So we decided, okay, we really understand the artist, we will design a, a record label. I didn't know much about music, and uh, very shortly thereafter, we recorded 10 CDs, including artists like Amarayoni and Yvonne Chaka Chaka, and uh, we realized that we're actually not very strong in marketing music, <laughs> physical music, that is. We were very good on the internet, but not the physical, and there weren't so many people buying uh, uh, physical product from international because of the delivery components, so I realized that I'm not brand center, and I don't have this long-term view of being able to sustain a long-term business in the music industry and decided to cut my losses. My partner at the time took over the record label and I'm very proud to say today it's really, really successful. So if I would have been patient, I would have been in a very, very successful business with nice annuity income and, and publishing and music rights, but it's called African Cream Music and it's really, really beautiful and it's sold in all the airports and you can see it in every single shop and we started it in, in 1999, so it was really, really exciting. And I guess the message of the story is that you have to fail to succeed. Another tremendous failure that I've had in my career has been uh, click and pay. Uh, we were actually sued by click and pay for an infringement of copyright. Okay? And I had, to, uh, I had to go and tell them that click and pay is actually an internet standard and it has nothing to do with their physical retail name. But uh, um, what happened was we were talking to pick and pay, and we were talking to Woolworths, and we were talking to all the big grocers, but they weren't ready to go online. Their mindset wasn't there. So we decided we'll do it ourselves, which is not always such a, 
a great idea. And uh, we won the best online grocery store in 1999 by Arthur Goldstock, but I think we won one of the only uh, grocery stores at the time. So it wasn't such a big deal. And, and I don't know if you remember this Accenture consulting project to try and promote e business at the time. It was uh, a guy called Dot Coza. He was stuck at the house, he had to shop online, and he couldn't leave the house. He was basically living off uh, click and pay and buying all these groceries uh, off all of our various websites. So we got great PR out of it. And uh, uh, we couldn't compete with the buying power. And eventually, when the big retailers did come online, uh, our prices were just not as competitive because at the end of the day in business, it's all about supply chain. It's about your ability to buy. And therefore, we had to close that particular business down. Um, one of the things that we also did a bit early was launch mobile commerce. And I love this quote by Victor Hugo, an invasion of armies can be resisted, but never an idea whose time has come. And in March 2000, we concluded, do, do any of you remember these big brick phones, those uh, Nokias, you can see the head of it over there. We concluded a mobile commerce transaction on one of these phones. And the internet was really, really slow. It was WAP, but WAP at 9.6 kilobits per second. Imagine at the time, the modems were 56K, and now you're getting fifth of the speed. So the, the worldwide wait became a lot longer. Okay, and uh, we developed a package solution though, our vision was great, and we could set up a wireless shop within 30 minutes for any one of our retail partners, which was just incredible, and we even had what's uh, similar to Mixit, the ability for you to chat directly to our content center from your phone. So, so uh, it was very, very innovative at the time, and it became what would be the trump card for, for the IPO that we did uh, on the FTSE later that year, and we could go to the market saying that the future is mobile commerce, and we are first to market, and I'm going to share with you uh, some of this roller coaster ride of this IPO. So, roller coasters are fun, okay? And I think I paid uh, some really, really good school fees in terms of my, my personal ca career. We, we listed on the FTSE in Gen 2000, we sold to a company called iTouch, and then did an IPO in June. And our vision was to take South African developed products into the rest of the world. So, uh, low cost labor technically speaking, in terms of developers, some really good IP. If we can make it happen with 50,000 people on the internet, let's go to the, where all the internet users are and set up offices in the UK and Ireland and Australia and New Zealand and Israel, wherever independent news and media, which owns the Star newspaper and Clear Channel Independent in South Africa, had media interest, iTouch would deliver mobile content and digitalmall.com would deliver mobile commerce. And although we were first to market and we raised 42 and a half million quid for 20% of the group, to give you an idea, there was over a billion rand uh, those days because the, the pound rand ratio was 28. Um, so it was a lot of money. The market crashed three months later. So we just kind of like skidded just before the market crash. So we were true dot com hype and dot com bomb type of environment. Uh, and our share price went from 70p uh, to 120p. And uh, 18 months later, when we decided to buy it out, it was 17p. Now, what they don't tell you when you do an IPO, and I was 29 years old, um, is that you can't sell your shares for the first year. And the market crashed like four months into it. So on paper, it looked great. You know? But the reality was that when we picked up our company back, we picked up a lot of debt. And we had to relook and re-strategize and refocus. And we decided to focus back on Africa. And boy, am I glad that we made that decision because I absolutely love being focused on Africa. And I really believe that Africa does not need handouts. What Africa needs is innovation. Uh, the continent has enjoyed 10 years of consecutive growth uh, exceeding the world average. Okay? In 10 years' uh, time, they said that seven out of the top 10 fastest growing economies are predicted to be in Africa. And we've got a billion consumers. I don't know how many of you read the book, Africa Rising. It's absolute jam. I really, really recommend it. Africa is really becoming a powerhouse. And in terms of Nigeria, which is the biggest uh, populated country in, in Africa, they've moved from a GDP of $35 billion to $207 billion in the last 10 years. Largely because of mass, massive foreign direct investment in the telco space. If you look at our own South African company, MTN, they made most of their money in Nigeria. They've got 45 million subscribers in Nigeria now, which makes a third of their total subscriber base. Uh, or maybe just under a third, and about 28% of the EBITDA is actually coming from one country in Africa, from Nigeria, okay, which is just unbelievable. 
So I think today what we're seeing is a lot of college graduates are opening to knowledge companies and are coming back from the diaspora. People that have left, went to live in the States, went to live in the UK, are coming back to Africa. And Africa is on the top of the list of every single private equity investor that I talk to. They're all intrigued when I say I live in Johannesburg and they're interested in this continent and in the investment in this continent. So what do we need to do as Africans? We need to leap for our connectivity and focus on affordability because if uh, I'm fighting to survive, how can I afford internet, which just seems to be a luxury, but actually it isn't, okay? I believe that it's a basic human right. And if we look at that continent, we're the only continent that has uh, still 2G connectivity and we don't have real broadband. It's changing, it's changing fast and it's exciting. In South Africa, we're getting LTE at the moment, which means that we're getting the latest generation uh, some of the European countries don't have uh, uh, LTE, so it means they'll be catching up. And this is really the opportunity, uh, this data is from the ITU, and, and they're really uh, showing how committed uh, telco companies around the world are into changing the infrastructure. So what we really need in Africa is we need ICT, and not ICT as information communication technology, but rather investment, creativity, and talent, just another definition that I came up with. And I think infrastructure development across the continent, uh, it's ma making it exponentially easier to do business. Uh, our endowment of mineral in, in Africa uh, is not just our only competitive advantage. If we look at India, and we look at China, and we look at how they've created so many jobs and so many skills, and how they compete globally, primarily on skills, not the natural resources. We need to even their playing field. And I think that access to energy is very important, and I love that earlier presentations uh, of today about how can we become more energy conscious because the world uh, will have a huge energy problem, okay? And over 60% of it will be in Africa. So we need to come up with ingenious solutions on how we're gonna uh, deal with some of these challenges. We need to light up the continent with innovation and connectivity while we preserve the natural beauty of Africa. And if I, if I, if I Reiterate that private equity returns are the highest on the continent. In Sub-Saharan Africa, over 25%, which is unheard of, okay, in the past five years. This is really a way for us to encourage investment, for people to come into Africa, and we can see huge economic growth the old-fashioned way, through entrepreneurs who start businesses and really make it happen, and create skills and therefore employment. Okay, so we need to move more from the old-type economy of assets being your minerals, to human capital. And the way we're gonna do that is if we're gonna digitally unite Africa. Africa, lack of infrastructure is not a disadvantage, it's actually an advantage because we can now leapfrog. We can now get the latest technology and we can learn from the experience of European or American companies that have actually invested in infrastructure and we're actually gonna to upgrade to the latest. So we're not gonna be in between, we're gonna go directly to the latest uh, technology. And Africa 2.0 is all about mobile 2.0. Okay, mobile is the most prominent device in South Africa. We've reached over 120% penetration, but in Africa, countries like Nigeria, 60%, people have their mobile, they love their mobile, they get a sense of security from it, and it opens up huge opportunities for very, very exciting applications. So the mobile has become a multi-purpose device. It is now a clock, we go to sleep with it right next to our bed, it's our address book, it's our GPS, all of us got here very, very easily today, uh, if we had GPSs in our cars, okay, uh, it becomes your key, your money, your credit card, your remote control, your music player, okay, your digital camera, I think that the sales of digital cameras have declined dramatically because of mobile phones, so it's very, very, very exciting. And that's what the innovation that we're looking for and the innovation that I'm asking all of you to take a deep thought and, and think about, how can we arrange the economic requirements for implementing an invention? Because this is what innovation is all about. And uh, this is a, a, an example of one of our company's easy apps that we invested in recently. And what we've done is we built a portable computer on a USB. Because of this affordab affordability issues that we discussed, uh, you can actually get uh, either on a USB or one of these phones, which is actually a, a 3G USB, uh, as well as a phone, okay? You can get apps that allow you to work offline and online because uh, data is still quite expensive in the region. And it's a very, very exciting uh, ability to bridge the digital divide. And it's under 100 grand, okay? Which is very, very exciting. So we're moving from ABC to ADC. And ADC stands for Access, Devices, and Content, okay? You need to have ubiquitous access, and it's got to be cost-effective, as we said earlier, human right. And the devices have got to be low cost, uh, based on affordability. So you might have 
uh, as you see in the picture there, uh, a low-cost 3G phone, or you might have an Android phone that looks like this, which is under $100, it's a dual SIM phone, okay, uh, and uh, you can do everything that you need on it, okay, and have all your applications preloaded on it, so for 800 grand, it's now becoming a lot more affordable than it used to be in the past. And content has got to be relevant, it's got to be language specific, and I work with a lot of different organizations around Africa that are now translating content, and, and Google Translate has become incredible in terms of the ability to translate on the fly. It might not be 100% accurate, but it's, it's a really, really powerful tool. Another big evolution, which is we're very proud of, that's come from Africa, and Africa definitely leads the way in mobile money. And it makes a lot of sense because mobile network operators have got the biggest coverage. And if you think about traditional banking, uh, the prepaid wallet is kind of equivalent to a current account. And because there's very little credit card penetration in Africa, it makes sense that we could use, everybody can transfer airtime, that we could transfer money, and we would use our mobile phone as the ability to transact uh, using mobile money in Africa. So if we look at a mobile network operator, they're also designed for per second billing where banks are not really good at those micro transactions as such. And therefore, uh, if you look at credit card transactions, when we launched Digital Mall in 98, you'd have to have 15 Rand minimum transaction, otherwise you can't use your credit card. I don't know what it is today, but it's probably similar to that, where if you just want to buy Coke for six bucks, you know, you can't use your credit card, so, but you could use your mobile phone to do that. Okay, you could top up with five Rand. So it makes a lot of sense. And the world is moving towards pay-per-use type models like this cloud type models like iTunes where you can pay per track. Or one of the things that struck me when I was in London recently and I went to Paddington Station, I wanted to make a P that said 30P there. So I thought I have to pay 30P to make a P. Okay, what if I don't have change? Okay, but if I could have a mobile wallet, I could immediately pay and get the convenience that I need to get uh, while I'm at the uh, railway station. Okay, so, Cash is not king, it's actually dangerous and expensive. I don't know how many of you have actually traveled to Africa and bought a Nando's meal in Nigeria. You have to take a wad of cash because they don't accept credit cards and it's dirty money and you're scared to walk around with so much money and it's just not a pleasant experience. And because Africa is so geographically dispersed, uh, it's, it's, it's really ideal, if you look at Namibia, it doesn't make sense with two-thirds of the country's desert to put branches all over Namibia. So mobile money makes a lot more sense. And I'm sure that violent crime statistics, because the cash is not actually sitting on me, will drop. And electronic money will have a positive impact on our environment because it will eliminate carbon emission on travel, printing of money, and uh, everything else that goes around it. Mobile government is another area that will be touched by mobile and you could get closer to your citizens and, and really save, serve the purpose of enabling a transparent and engaging communication. A great case study is the elections in 2004, 2005 in South Africa. I don't know how many of you used the SMS facility, but you could actually send an SMS to see if you registered to vote or not. Or you could go to an ATM machine, enter your ID number and see whether you registered to vote or not, or go to a website. So it's all about multi-channel kind of communication. Agriculture is also, uh, four days ago, on the 16th of October, it was World Food Day, and because of the food shortage, which was mentioned in the earlier talks, we really believe that uh, agriculture is very, very important for Africa, and uh, a great example is farmers in Ghana that now use their mobile phone to send a text message to find out about crop prices in Accra, which are 400 kilometers away and they don't actually have to drive there. And social networking today is, is really very, very tribal, if you think about it. Facebook would be, or Twitter would be one of the biggest tribes out there. And I really like this book, if you didn't read it, from, from Seth Godin. It talks about a group of people that are connected to one another, are connected to a leader, uh, are connected to an idea. And uh, I think it's really an African advantage, and that uh, tribes are really going to revolutionize uh, the future of where we're going to move forward. So, this quote really summarizes everything that I said. If you don't like change, you're going to like your relevance even less. And the message that I'd like you to take away from my talk today is that be the soldier in the field rather than the critic in the stand.